Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad to have you here in person on Zoom um, in spirit. Glad you're here. And uh, we had an amazing presentation last Friday with David Nielsen. That was quite a treat. And if you weren't there in person, I hope you were able to watch a 37 minute um, video. And you put that up on YouTube, right? So, do all, I hope you all know. Oh, she's just amazing. Grateful for all she does for all of us. Jamita from Salt Lake is here. Hi, Jamita. Glad you're here. From Nepal. She traveled the farthest. She gets to eat first. Um, so let's start uh, today with the word of prayer. And it's going to be a beautiful Portuguese prayer. I know other than, I, I want to say Iolanda. I okay. Yeah. Pedimos paz social. Pai, obrigada pela oportunidade que nós temos de podermos estar aqui juntos e de podermos desfrutar deste momento. Pai, queremos te pedir para que o teu Espírito nos possa acompanhar e para que possa estar connosco e para que possamos ouvir os oradores e possamos ser inspirados por aquilo que eles vão dizer. Pai, nós agradecemos pelo teu amor e por um, o sacrifício espiritual do teu filho Jesus Cristo. E é isso que nós queremos deixar em nome de Jesus Cristo. Amém. Amém. Thank you. Uh, beautiful to me. My wife grew up in São Paulo and then served her mission later on in Brasil. So I wish she was here. And for every day of our marriage, mostly night of our marriage, she was doing, um, what's that program? Duolingo. Duolingo. <laughs> okay, what are you doing, dear? I got to do my Duolingo. <laughs> this week, uh, we are privileged to have two dear friends of IPNT, two alumni of IPNT, and two masters and experts in the field of instruction and instructional design. Uh, Richard Swan, Associate Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And how many of you already know Ken Plummer, who's one of the consultants? I'm in the back. Okay, wonderful. And all of you are going to take his class, right? <laughs> um, stats class. It's a stats class. It's one of the more easy ones, one of the more fun <laughs> ones. So <laughs> well, we're grateful that he's also an adjunct instructor for the department. Um, Richard and I go way back don't we? And David Nilsson, whom we, we talked or we heard, listened to last week, and I go way back. Um, and what you may not know is that before the CTL existed, it was what's called a CID. And if you wanted to know what existed before CID, it was actually for a year OCD. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, uh, so President Bateman brought me over um, to get course development on campus started. I'd been doing that over in continuing at independent study. So he made me the director of the short-lived Office of Course Development. We were in Quonset Huts. Used to be in World War II, the, uh, the shooting range here on campus. It's now a parking lot. And then um, we reorganized into the CID, the Center for Instructional Design. Was it like four or five years later, Richard, it became the Center for Teaching and Learning. And their mission has, has evolved a little bit as most institutions, especially in higher ed do. And so it may even be our opportunity to hear a little bit more from, from uh, Richard about what the current mission of CTL is and how they are continuing to evolve and service the needs of the com academic community. But we're grateful for them and wanna give one last plug for your finishing up your interviews with alumni and your attendance at the defenses. We're almost halfway, almost 15 out of 30 have done both, but we're down to the last half of the semester. So make sure you take advantage of any of our next uh, defenses and then start calling the alumni. You two, are you willing to be interviewed and tell them a little bit about your journey? So here are two across campus. That would be awesome to interview um, if you'll reach out to them sometime in the next few weeks. These are fun to read and I think you're enjoying both the interviews and the defense. It's taking a lot of your stress and anxiety away. And that's part of the goal of seminar. So let's turn the time over to both of you. Uh, we'll go up to 10 minutes too. And if you can maybe leave a few minutes for question and answer, that'd be awesome. Thank you again, Richard and Kim. It's the Richard and Ken show. Okay. <laughs> I'm a straight man and who's the, <laughs> I, I think I'm the straight man. Okay. Um, 
by the way, everybody say hi to Holt. Our other alumni that's trashing our party for you. Hopefully, it's not refreshments or something. Are you willing to be here too? Sure. I just don't serve a Just a we talk to ladies in the program that specialized in design. And I will that EIMP converts the property, but it's part of the design team. It's just for the assessment measure guys. Yeah. And I do library assessment. So if you put one of those wonderful surveys from the library, and when we talk, we listen. So and we've worked a lot with this group for the CID lab. We are honored to have Holt with us today. And then next week we will do some uh, mental health uh, work. We'll have somebody from CAPS with us to give us some tips on survive drafts here. <laughs> okay, so Scott wanted us to give a little bit of background and kind of, um, you know, what our program has done for us, I guess, as well, too. So, um, you know, I started in the day, I still remember real floppy disks, right? The real floppy disks. So computers were just coming out, computers in education. That was kind of my attraction to the field initially was that. I actually developed an international award-winning chemistry laboratory simulation. <laughs> It was a great success. It was also one of my biggest disappointments because we programmed it so that students would have to learn and try and experiment and figure things out. And then as soon as the publisher picked it up, what did they want? They wanted worksheets. And so we were back to cookbook chemistry again, even though we had built the simulation so you didn't have to do cookbook chemistry. Dr. Swan, Dr. West is editing a book right now where he's collecting chapters of failure. Oh, there we okay. <laughs> it's like success that's a failure, right? Go figure. I'm hard to sold to that. I remember. Yes. Um, yeah, but you know, one of the, it's the same thing, even at CID, we were the Center for Instructional Design, and even with the simulation, one of the things that came out was all the technology was as good as the teacher that was using it and no better, right? It was either great or it was terrible, depending on how that teacher used it. And what we found at the CID is there was a gradual, just this natural organic move toward faculty development because we we're trying to help them to use technology well and they needed to learn how to teach well in order to use the technology well, right? So that's part of the reason, again, behind the name change to the Center for Teaching and Learning. And now I'm the associate director. There are five teaching and learning consultants, and their specific job is to work with faculty and to help them learn how to teach better, right? Get some good pedagogy, some good assessment skills, things that they probably did not learn in their graduate program. So, and Center for Teaching and Learning at BYU is something. It's actually one of those world-class places that you would never know it, but you compare our CTL to 95% of the other ones around the world, and we are swimming in resources and personnel and capability and just good innovative things. So anyway, and by the way, faculty development is another career path that you could choose that is really kind of coming of its own. It used to be kind of this afterthought, but almost every university or college now has and needs to have a Center for Teaching and Learning or equivalent. Okay, anyway, that's enough about me. You want to take a few minutes before we dive in? Yeah, I'll just go briefly. Um, so um... I was a seminary, a full-time seminary teacher for years. And during lunchtime, when we'd get together, um, we would talk amongst ourselves about the right way to teach. And it seemed like the, the eight years I was there, this right way to teach just kind of drifted and drifted and drifted. And, and someone would come in and goes, I've got it. 
I have got it. This is the thing. And we'd all listen with rapt attention. But after a while, you don't listen with rapt attention. You think, I've, I've heard this excitement before. And, and these, I think, were, I think we, we did the best we could. But it dawned on me that we were just sharing good anecdotal stories with each other. And I kept thinking, I wonder if there's a science, I mean, I should have known, there's a science behind this. And so eventually that led me to come into this program, Instructional Psychology and Technology. And eventually I went up to the church office building and worked with, um, worked with seminaries and institutes with um, research evaluation and assessment. And at that time, there was an interest in actually assessing things, not by everybody, um, there was some concern as we began to develop a suite of assessments. Like imagine targeting things like belief scales or teaching by the spirit scales, things that most people would say, well, you cannot measure. And by the way, I think that's, that is a true statement in part, but it's much more complex than that. And so the ability, and even I think for some of the general authorities that would hear these great stories from all across the world, but letting the letting the administration and seminars and institutes know that when we make big decisions, we can't just go off these stories. Stories are good, but they need to be coupled with something that shows patterns across the entire system. And so that's what got me into quantitative inquiry and assessment. And so, which, um, and teaching the statistics class. Now, how many are in the statistics class that are with us or have taken it before? Very good. And see, they're smiling, some of them. <laughs> and so, Anyway, that was my journey, both to IPNT and also to, and coming down to Center for Teaching and Learning, I enjoyed the assessment part, but I needed an experience doing something that was, was, was more of a fuller experience uh, with the entire instructional design process, with assessment being a component of that. Back to you, Richard. So uh, AUCT is right around the corner, and it turns out I think there, I don't know. It turns out actually that, that myself and Ken and Rick West were going to receive an award from the research division for our theoretical paper. So we thought it would be fun to kind of share a little bit of that so you don't have to go through the pain of reading it, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll give you the good stuff. Uh, how did it come about? So <laughs> it turns out that Ken. Oh my goodness. In his job as a teaching and learning consultant was observing an organic Where I'm going to try not to turn red. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Was observing an organic chemistry teacher. And uh, I'm going to shorten the story a little bit, Ken, so forgive I me. Because your mind's very long. Yes. But he's up there trying to show the students how this certain problem is worked out and how there are different conditions that have to be met and so on and so forth. And as he's doing this, Ken realizes. This professor has this all mapped out in his head. He knows exactly where he's going, and his students have no clue. They're lost. Right? So the question was, can we pull that map out of that expert's mind and put it out on paper? Right? And is that going to help students? And then... Ken, as a consultant, was working with Lane Fisher on CPSC 651, the statistics course that some of you are in, right, that all of you should take if you really want to understand statistics. And they started mapping out this idea of what would you do as an expert as you approach a real-world situation? What are the decisions you would make? And what we found was, wow, this is actually kind of working pretty well. So the question is, right, this is so typical. You find something that works and you want to figure out, okay, why is it working? We know it works, why? So as we were digging around, we, we found these ideas. This is from How People Learn 2000. That we could look at this in terms of there are different types of knowledge, procedural knowledge, the how-to, so tasks, algorithms, right? Conditional knowledge, when and under what conditions does it apply? And conceptual knowledge, concepts, theories, models, patterns, and so forth, right? The why of things. And what we kind of realized was that decision-based learning is filling in this conditional knowledge gap that seems to be present. 
So, and, and we found this to be true, this idea, knowledge that is not conditionalized is inert. By the way, this, he wrote this in the 19 teens. So it's been a hundred years since somebody actually said this, and yet we haven't done that much about it. So this all led us into the research on how experts become experts, because that's one of the one of the things that experts have conditional knowledge that novices do not, and that helps them function in their space at a much better uh, capacity than novices, right? So we're looking at how experts learn, and one of the things that this is the this is where we get into the paper now. You're all familiar with these levels of expertise, probably, right? These are ancient; they come from the Middle Ages. There's an apprentice; he's learning. The journeyman, actually, I found out in this that what a journeyman means is you can actually send him out on a day's journey to do a job, and he can do it unsupervised. That's what that means. That's why he's a journeyman. So he can work independently. An apprentice has to be supervised. And then there's the expert who does what they do really well. And then there's the expert's expert, which is the master, who just seems to have that little bit of something extra that nobody can quite put their finger on, the person who can also invent new things, come up with new ideas. So there's that. Well, it turns out that you can actually map these levels to those same kinds of knowledge that we were looking at that experts have, that apprentices are learning the procedural knowledge of the discipline, that the conditional knowledge a journeyman now acquires is actually what allows them to be independent because now they know when to use the procedures that they're able to perform, right? And then the expert has conceptual knowledge, so they're reasoning at a higher level, so they're able to now be adaptive and creative where the journeyman is just doing their job. And then the master is the person who is revisiting all three of those and helping to broaden the field, create new procedures or conditional knowledge or concepts or theories, right? And it also seemed like it would be a good idea to kind of change those names from being person specific to something a little bit more descriptive. And so this idea that we have procedural expertise, functional expertise, because I can now function in the real world on my own, adaptive expertise, which is what that conceptual knowledge allows me to do, is to now adapt what I know to different situations, and then generative expertise, which is what all of you graduate students are expected to um, be contributing to, especially as you graduate being able to extend the knowledge of the discipline, right? Okay. What's also implied here is that this is a developmental progression, right? You have to start out as an apprentice, you move up as a journeyman, and so on and so forth. What the literature says too is that you could be stuck in any one of these levels for your whole life. And what you need to do, it's not just that you need to have more experience, you actually need to acquire different types of knowledge to move up in levels of expertise, okay? So it's not just a matter of time and practice. You've actually got to acquire different knowledge. So what does typical education do? Well, if you look at it, mostly what we focus on are concepts, right? We're trying to teach conceptual knowledge. We have a little bit of procedural knowledge and hardly ever do you maybe a few anecdotal stories every once in a while that reveal a little bit of conditional knowledge. And I love that quote because I think it's so true if you think about it. I just think even in my life, right? You go to school, you get all this stuff and you go out and you start working. And all of a sudden, as you're working at this, this light bulb clicks on and you say, oh, that's what they were trying to tell me, right? Because now I'm in the conditions where that concept applies, suddenly that light bulb goes on, but I had to acquire that conditional knowledge for myself. 
right? So what would happen if we actually explicitly introduce conditional knowledge into the mix instead of leaving it out? And there's an extensive literature on the expert blind spot, by the way, which uh, shows that experts like faculty members tend to leave out about 40 to 70 percent of what a novice would need to know to do what they're doing. Because it just seems natural and normal to them. It seems obvious, right? It's like, how can they not get it? Except, you know, novices, we don't. Okay, there's another aspect to this as well too, this idea that we can increase in fluency. This was another thing that came out of the literature of expertise that it's not just about more stuff, having more knowledge, it's actually about being able to use it well, use it expertly, right? Fluency was a good metaphor for that. So you can actually increase your fluency within each level, but to become more expert, you also need to increase your fluency, your ability to use it flexibly, right, fluently between levels so that you can connect your conceptual knowledge to your procedural knowledge. And it, it turns out, it looks like that conditional knowledge is kind of the bridge between those two. It's kind of the glue that pulls everything together and actually make things work, right? So conditional knowledge is a big deal. And I think there's actually some research that could go on just in that space of what happens with conditional knowledge when we introduce it. But that brings us to decision-based learning back around again that we were trying to explain. And how can we explain it? Well. We actually look at it, we organize instruction, not logically around the logical relationships, but actually functionally around the functional relationships or the conditional knowledge, which allows us to develop a degree of functional fluency. So you can actually use what you're learning, right? So people in the statistics class, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Ken. Would you agree with that statement? See one nodding head at least and a thumbs up back there. Okay. That's enough for me. <laughs> and a thumb. Well, that's my part. Now you get to have a fun part. So, um, vision based learning was an approach that I think evolved in our minds over time. And um, essentially, like Richard said, it's designed to target this notion of conditional knowledge. I'm going to get a little personal here. Um, I was in the dentist office. Uh, they were extracting a tooth on Monday. There was an abscess. I experienced a degree of pain that I think really developed my character now in retrospect. In the moment, I wasn't thinking about that. But um, as, the, as the dentist was working on extracting my back molar, um, he was training. He was training one of his, his staff there. And, and she was basically a novice. And then there was another staff who had more expertise and she was guiding her. And it was interesting because the, the novice would say, oh, do you need this tool right here? Because she'd always used that tool in the past. And he said this, no, not in this situation, not in this situation. So he saw something in my mouth that triggered in his mind, the lack of relevance for that particular tool. Thank goodness. And he went on to a different tool, which was more relevant to my particular situation. Conditional knowledge in the literature has been broken down into what we call condition action pairs. You see a condition, you take an action. Now that's overly simplistic because what happens in life is we get hit with multiple conditions. And we learn how to navigate those multiple conditions to make a reasoned course of action. And in the literature, as Richard said, Bransford and Gobey and many others have said, there is a lack of systematic instruction on conditional knowledge. And you'll get smatterings of it. It'll usually be something like this. You know, when you're out in the field, or when I was back in industry, 
Now, there's nothing wrong with those expressions. I, I mean, I think it's very appropriate to say those. But also there's an acknowledgement that you kind of get a smattering of it as opposed to something that's a little more systematic. And making it systematic is a huge endeavor. And we've attempted to do that to some degree in DBL. Initially, we were so excited about this tool we had. And over the years, we've been humbled by life <laughs> and have realized that you know, it is a good tool, but it has its limitations. And there are probably other tools that could be generated, uh, generative knowledge that could go beyond it. I'm going to show you a quick video that sort of captures the DBL idea. I apologize. I am the narrator, so you're going to hear my voice again. But I'm the video in the background. So we'll do that. Teaching reasoning skills is one of the holy grails of instruction. The world we live in requires an ability for our learners to examine and navigate complex issues. Consider the multiple factors that make up those issues, weigh those factors appropriately, and, and determine, determine their interrelationship. In order to make it more comfortable and easier to understand, the database offers more detailed and sophisticated methods supported by software. DBL presents a scenario problem. And then poses a series of questions with options. Learners can select until they reach an endpoint where, based on the answers to the previous questions, they can move or select a well thought out answer. Automatic feedback is available to guide learners through a learning process. Your learners can access just enough just in time instruction to each decision point in order to learn the definition. Example. And explanations for each option to then return to the decision model and make a reason selection at the corresponding decision point. DBL can be used with any discipline or training. For learners, you need to take into account multiple factors to make a well thought out decision. Your DBL consultant can introduce you to a process that will assist you in developing DBL learning activities that will help your learners develop their critical thinking skills in your course. So just a little history of DBL. Uh, so the idea, at least for me personally, was it was in January. I remember the date. This is going to sound really weird. January 23rd, 2013. What were you doing on that day? Yeah. Um, at least I know you were all on the planet, at least that, that year. Um, but just as Richard described it, I sat in an organic chemistry class. This was the first time this instructor had ever taught a university class ever. And he had 250 students in those tiered classrooms. And it just hit me as he was working through the problem that he understood how all the conditions, the factors, the assumptions, how they were all interrelated in that moment. And I thought, I was just sitting there thinking, he has got that all mapped out in his head. I wonder if you could go public with that. I wonder if you could show those interrelationships and then use it as an instructional tool for students. So that's where that came from. We um, started using it in the statistics course. I remember the day Lane Fisher came into my class because I had shared this idea with the geology department. Uh, they were asking another question. At that point, I, every answer had to do with this. And I remember as their eyes were glazing over, even I could notice the glazing over of the <laughs> eyes, um, that you know, they, they weren't connecting with this idea and I wasn't understanding my audience. But Lane Fisher came to my office and we partnered to work on his class. And I just said, Lane, can you give me a problem that you, someone coming out of your course should be able to handle? So he wrote it up on my whiteboard. I said, okay, what's the first decision you make? He goes, well, that's easy. He kept saying that over and over. Well, that's easy. <laughs> like a good expert would say, I want to know, is this a descriptive or inferential problem? So I wrote that up on the whiteboard. Some of you are in the classroom like, oh, okay, that's where, that's where the software came from because you're living that particular decision point with every assignment you take, um, you finish. And so I said, okay, well, what is this problem? And he said, well, that's easy. That's an inferential problem. How do you know? And then he started underlining the clues in the problem that would suggest that was an inferential problem. I said, okay, Lane, now that we know it's an inferential problem, what's the next question? That's easy. Are we dealing with um, 
comparing, are we comparing means? Are we looking at the relationship between variables? Are we looking at independence of variables or the goodness of fit between a claim and reality? I'm writing this all on the board. I go, okay, what do we got here? He goes, that's, we're comparing between means. I go, really, how do you know? I kept going back to the expert. What are the clues in, in the problem that let you know that we are comparing means and we're not doing those other things? And so we kept working and working and working through a host of decision points until a decision model cascaded down my whiteboard. And the learning outcome emerged that he was going to, we were trying to select the appropriate statistical method based on the wording of a research question. Well, years later, we've worked with, I don't know the number, 50, 60, 70 faculty, mostly here at BYU, but other universities in Asia and Latin America. And I never tire of putting them through that experience. Give me a scenario you want your students to solve or work through. What are the questions you ask within yourself to break that problem down? Just list them. And they, they write them out and write them. I said, okay, what's the first question you would probably ask? And sometimes order, it's hard for them to determine what's the appropriate question to ask. What are the options? And as they put those options under the questions, we take that list of questions and options and put them into the decision-based learning software. And then that becomes a guide for the students. We've done this in business, to, uh, information systems, accounting, human resources. I'm just kind of going through it. in nursing. We just um, have a decision model in property law. I learned a lot about present interest versus uh, future interest. Um, let's see, we've done some language work uh, in linguistics. And I'm going to miss, but a lot of work here in IPNT, several of the faculty here have used it. And so let's see, by 2016, we were using, uh, we were using the software, first iteration of it. Then we integrated into a learning management system, and now it's used. Um, last year, we had about 4,000 students here at BYU that used it, and then some other universities as well. So that's a little background on the timeline. Um, EBL uh, proliferation. So um, here are some recent publications. This is the one that is receiving the award. Um, you know, I thought the reviewers were kind of hard on us, Richard. So we were actually shocked that we got this award. And maybe they just drew, a, drew out of a hat you know, or something, mm -hmm. but, but we're grateful. And, and really kudos to Richard because he really put a lot of work into it. Grateful for Dr. West as well in that endeavor. But here are some publications that have come out in the last five years. Um, we published a book in 2021, and these are basically each faculty member wrote a chapter that had an experience with DBL and authored a chapter. And then we have some introductory and concluding chapters. Um, these are some uh, graduate projects and theses that mostly have come out of, of IPNT and some other uh, departments across campus. And then um, some conference presentations that we and others have done in different parts of the country and the world. And then some invited uh, workshops. This was interesting. I, I went to China and I was to do a DBL workshop. I thought I was going to be there with faculty. Um, we didn't have clear communication. It turned out to be 18 to 20 year olds who lack expertise. And so that was an interesting experience. They how to decide what movie to go to. That became the decision model. Of <laughs> how to determine whether up neck is an appropriate snack if you're going hiking or something like that. So it was, I, it was quite a cultural experience for me to get into their minds. Um, also, Tokyo University in Japan, um, that's where we actually, they were typing in Japanese kanji in our software. We found out that actually worked. And uh, it was a great experience. And then a number of experiences down in Peru, as well as the United States. Um, here's some current projects that we're working on with uh, Dr. Leary. We're working, finishing up an article um, in an advanced nursing course, um, a Bio 100 course. We're moving forward with a qualitative study, eternal families and restoration course. Um, with this one, they throw uh, a lot of different statements out, doctrinal statements. Well, actually, they're statements. Some of them are doctrinal, some of them are not. And you take those statements through a gauntlet of questions to determine if it's, if, 
there is a case to be made for that to be official church doctrine of Latter-day Saint faith. And so that one is coming online. I think about six or 700 students will be using it next month. And so we're excited. And so we have a lot of data that comes. We have, I guess this is my pitch to you. For those of you that are interested in doing qualitative or quantitative studies or any kind of study related to DBL, the field is what we describe as white. As white as maybe even already to harvest, for those of you familiar with that. And then future studies with the human resource course. Now that we've begun to work with law courses, we'd love to have some qualitative studies there, communication disorders, and as well as chemistry. Okay, so we're just looking at our time, make sure we have time for Q&A. Why don't we just do Q&A or did you wanna do something else? I'd, I'd show them the software just super, okay. super fast, five sure. minutes. Okay. Four minutes. So here is the software. This is a demo version of what the students in my class are subjected to. <laughs> so they take a problem and there's that descriptive inferential. So here's the, here's the question, which facilities experience more safety anxiety measured on a scale of one to 10 US European or African facilities? You sample 101 from US facilities, 89 from European and 83 from African facilities. Now the learning outcome here is as I mentioned before, is um, the students will need to, we want them to select the appropriate method based on the wording of a research question. Every decision model is guided by a learning outcome. Without a learning outcome, that model can go on into eternity, which is a problem as you can imagine. So when we first started this, the faculty would go, are we there yet? We don't have any more questions to ask. And so it, it dawned on us, well, the bookend there is what do you want your students to do at the end of going through the model? And that became the final decision point. And so students look at this and they see the, this initial problem. Is this problem, is the problem above descriptive or inferential? If they're unsure, they click on how do I decide? And then they just go through the instruction where they get definitions and examples. The key here with conditional knowledge is the ability to see the abstract definition with a concrete example, and then see the connection between the concrete and abstract, um, make abstract connections. Now, the challenge here is one example will never do it. You need lots of examples for students to make that connection. So they go through the just enough, just in time instruction. Sometimes they even practice. And they're trying to master this particular decision point right here. So let's say I look at that and I go, okay, the clue in the problem is samples. So I don't have access to everyone. So I'll go inferential. Then comes the next question. Relationship difference or goodness of fit. Would you like to see what happens when I go down a wrong path? The wrong path. And we have four different levels of feedback. <clears throat> this one, you can get the immediate feedback, delayed feedback, <coughs> feedback. It could be an exam. But here it takes you right back to the place you deviated. I could have used that in life. Uh, <laughs> but eventually you'll get to the final decision point. And I just hope I get this right. That actually is three levels. And what do those in my class think if we look at this? For the record, I have three levels of the independent variable. And one way or Nova. Nova. Right there. And then you go to the next problem. What happens is the next problem will share the same answers as the previous problem, but then deviate slightly. This is where the conditional knowledge is developed as you take more and more problems. And after a while, would my students agree that it just goes faster and faster over time? Any of you? Okay. Connor, could you describe the speed at which you're doing it now? Uh, sure. Compared to the beginning? Uh, I mean, it's pretty darn slow. What's also beneficial is in your class, when you're um, going through it, you can scroll down in that text box that you have up there. And you might find some specific feedback. I don't yeah. Know this. We have different levels of scaffolding, and sometimes, especially the real challenging courses, um, you uh, there's a mechanical engineering course where the students struggle, even in the decision model. And so we recommend that they can scroll down and actually see the instructor's answer. Um, also, students or an entire class can see how they're performing 
with this heat map here, this is the entire model. This was the particular path we went down for that one problem. And then green means I've made a lot of good choices in life. And orange to red, not so good. And I can check on any one of these details. I can say, okay, well, it looks like I'm struggling here. So I'll click on the details. It tells me how many problems that I've actually taken through this decision point, how many correct, and then I can see where have I spent most of my time across those three options there. And then you can, students can also practice. And uh, what happens is the colors will change the more I practice that they're like, this is like flashcards on steroid mm -hmm. because you can use a flashcard at a specific decision point, but you can select the decision points that come after them or before them. So there are some options there. The idea is to put as much control in, um, in the lap of the learner so that they can determine where are my gaps and what can I do to fill those gaps. Did we cover everything there? That's good. Okay. All right, and our final eight minutes. We'd love to entertain questions that you have or just anything related to this topic. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Okay. What is your name? I'm Melanie Jensen. Melanie. So um, a learner uses this while they're in your class and then they go out into the professional world. What do they have to take with them? Do they have like a printout of the decision tree? What are they taking with them into the professional world that helps them to continue to make the same decisions? Good question. Right now, um, while they're at BYU, since it was developed at BYU, um, it is a software that's free to BYU. Um, once you leave BYU, you don't have access to it. So that is kind of a problem. Um, in the past, I don't know if any of the students in, the, in here, before we had the software, um, we actually would bring out 11 by 17 sheets of paper. And so as we would take them through problems, we use PowerPoint, they would actually draw out their decision models. And I, I went to some of their offices and I would see it hanging there. It was very touching to see the decision model. So several of them said, yeah, I've used that. Um, but we need to find a better way to make it accessible for students who have taken a DBL course. I'm curious to know what was what has been the biggest limitation criticism. You said you were surprised that this paper received the award because the reviewers really went after you after the content. I'm just curious to know what is it that sometimes trips up some some of the world that doesn't see things the way we see it. Well, we were putting a couple of things together, right? The whole idea of conditional types of knowledge with expert levels. And there was a little bit of misunderstanding about how we were putting those together and a little bit of misunderstanding about how we were ordering those in saying, look, there's this developmental progression. So I had to put in some more examples really to kind of flesh out that to kind of show this is I can show you how this works, right? That you, you learn the procedures. I use mathematics. You know, you learn, you learn addition and subtraction and you can do it all the time, right? Then somebody teaches you about commutativity and that, if, that the order makes a difference. Well, if I just learned that, but I, and then I give it a story problem, well, students look at that and they don't know how to parse that out. They don't know that if, they don't know to say, well, is this a, an addition problem or a subtraction problem. They need the conditional knowledge to even look at that and say, oh, this is a subtraction problem. So if it's subtraction, then I have another condition, which means I have to be careful about the order of my numbers, right? And that was kind of the example I used, but it took a little bit of just being more clear about some of those connections. It helps a lot. And then um, understandably, I mean, it's just one tool of many and not all faculty should necessarily be excited about or even use it. Um, there are some faculty are get really excited about this notion of what are the decisions I'm making when I tackle a particular problem. And so they'll create their decision models. Uh, we call it the internal aha of the expert. It's like it dawns on that, oh, that's what I'm doing. And many will say, you know, I didn't know I'm making 20s decisions in a nanosecond, which thing I had not supposed. <laughs> so kind of an awareness there. But, you know, uh, even in engineering, some do not like the cookie cutter notion of it. 
the idea of, well, there can't be just one right answer because they're living in a generative world where there isn't one right answer. But the challenge is that novices have to live in a world where there are right answers and eventually get, I mean, there's probably a lot of ways to view that. So we see decision-based learning or the, the model itself as a nice scaffold for novices, but eventually, and those in the class, um, you use the decision model, but are you finding you use it less? Stephanie, could you speak to that if you don't want to be putting you on the spot? Well, like in the example that he gave where he asked what it was, like shockingly, I was able to say, to say what it is without having to walk through the whole thing because I have walked through the whole thing enough times that I recognize the clues in the question and I know where it's going to lead. So actually the goal in a typical DBL classroom is to put the decision model out of business. The students are using the decision model at the end of the semester. It was designed as a scaffold and implied in the idea of a scaffold is that it must ultimately come down. So when we first started, we had the decision model all the way to the end. And then in our oral interviews at the end of the semester, we're like, wow, they're not retaining this stuff. And we realized, oh, we have to wean them off the model. We use the model and then wean them off it. And so that's kind of our response. You get a badge first. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, we want to thank both of you. How many of you now? This was your answer to your thesis. This was the end. Oh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just thank you very, very much. This is your future. <laughs> <laughs> and these are our friends, our dear friends. So a couple of things before we have a prayer on the food. How many of you have not picked up your one of a kind t-shirt? Okay, there's some in the back. Please, please. You know, we want you to wear these more than we've seen you wear them, okay? <laughs> and then we uh, why don't you come on up, will you? Oh, go ahead, Haley. Um, and then, and then will you make an announcement about yeah, for the tomorrow. close, I mean, the open house? Yes, tomorrow is our activity, our opening social heritage night. And it's at six to seven here. Going to be fun, uh, coloring activities and pumpkins and just bring anything you want. It doesn't have to be your own culture. It could be whatever culture you love and I want to share with everyone else. So there's a sign up sheet online on the doc that you can it's say what you're going to bring. need to be reminded where to access it. No, no. It was emailed out a couple days ago. Yes. <laughs> and I hopefully, yeah. I'll... Nelson, did I read an email from you this morning too? Are you putting together mentors or do you want to say anything about that quickly? Right now. Okay. Perfect. Tomorrow. Um, and in case you want to see me tonight, uh, <laughs> it's our info session tonight, which I sent an email about. Um, tell your friends, like you people are the ones who bring in great other people into the program. So um, if you know someone who's interested, 